Good evening. It's good to have you with us. As you can tell, Awana is back in season. <laughs> so those of you in the cheap seats, I don't see anybody, but if you're in the cheap seats, come on up. So we're going to try and have some discussion as we did last week. Uh, we're playing 20 questions, if you didn't know. Uh, we asked nine questions last week, so I'm going to try to get through 11 questions today, and we've been studying uh, in 1 John, and so uh, we're in chapter 4, we're going to finish up verses 7 through 21, which then puts us into chapter 5, and we'll finish that up by the 11th of September, and then by then our uh, senior pastor, Corey Olivier, will be on site starting the next week, so looking forward to that, and uh, just... Uh, Looking forward to all that God's going to continue to do through our church. So let's open up in a word of prayer, and uh, then we'll dive in and we'll get started. Father, what a great day it is to gather together and to uh, worship you by studying your word, learning more about you, and learning how we continue to draw close to you. And so I pray that as we continue our study in 1 John, and as we're studying about love in particular tonight, that we would see very clearly how you have demonstrated your love for us. And so, uh, Lord, may you uh, help us uh, listen and help us uh, open our hearts to be receptive to what it is you need to tell us, uh, and may we respond appropriately. We certainly pray for our Awana teachers and leaders as they're preparing and gearing up for uh, Awana that will begin next week with, uh, with our kids. Pray for our youth as they're meeting. I ask you to be in and among their midst, and our children as they're finishing up their great Jungle Journey uh, sessions tonight. So, Father, uh, just help us uh, continue to draw close to you by uh, being obedient to do what it is you have called us to do. In thy name we pray. Amen. All right, so uh, let's continue on in 1 John 4, and we'll just kind of start and pick up where we left off last week. I ask you a series of questions, and in that series of questions, they're designed to help us dig deeper uh, in uh, God's Word. And so um, if somebody could bring a sheet up here, we've got somebody up here who needs an extra sheet. I do a handout each Wednesday night, so they're going to grab one and bring it up to you, I think, uh, as we as we continue to study. So let's start in 1 John 4. If you'd like to open up your passage there, we'll start in verse 7. I will continue to read the passage as we go through, and um, let's just pick up there. So 1 John chapter 4. Starting in verse 7, it says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest. Now, what does that word manifest mean? Shown, revealed, Demonstrated, yes. It's so in this, the love of God was revealed, shown, demonstrated among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe that love, the love that God has for us. God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is so also we in this are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears 
has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says that I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he does not love his brother whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So fairly lengthy passage, fairly lengthy. We've spent some time on it. And again, the major theme of this passage can be summed up in one word. And what is that word? Love, right? So uh, absolutely. So we've been talking about love and a lot to do with it. So that is the key word in the passage. We kind of went through several questions last week to dig into a little bit. Hey, why is love so important to God? And I mentioned that it kind of marks the character of who God is. And so it's important. It's one of his characteristics of his many characteristics of his many attributes Love is one of those. And so in that, we see that love is demonstrated through his son, Jesus Christ, and we, through the giving of his son, Jesus Christ, so that we could be forgiven. We're going to drill into that a little bit more tonight as uh, Scripture uh, moves us in that particular direction. Well, one of the questions I asked last week um, was, you know, why are people so hard to love? Why are people so hard to love? Can we count the ways? Uh, you count the ways they're what? Because they're, well, because they're sinners, we're sinners, right? So let's be honest. If I'm saying people are so hard to love, even myself, everybody in this room at some point or time, hard to love, right? Because we're sinners. People are hard to love. And in doing that, because people are hard to love, sometimes we're going to get hurt with that love, Right? Not maybe on purpose, but we are going to get hurt with the love. What was the example I gave last week as we were talking about getting hurt? Porcupine. The porcupine, right? The common North American porcupine. As we discovered those quills as we talked about. Now think, this is how God designed the porcupine. But when the porcupine attacks, what do those quills do once they enter your body? They expand, right? Because of your body temperature, when those quills hit your body, they're going to expand. Those barbs are going to expand, and it's going to make it harder to pull out. We can get hurt that way as well because people throw barbs at us. And let's be honest, because we're human and we're hard to love, sometimes we throw those barbs out as well. And so as we dig into Scripture, we're going to pick up uh, with question 10 tonight. So question 10, as we kind of look at our sheet, begins with this. It's, so we've talked about getting hurt with love. We've talked about all the different things that could happen over the past couple of weeks. So a lot of times, if we get hurt, what is our tendency? Withdraw. To withdraw. What else? What is our tendency? If we get hurt, what are we going to do? Hurt back. Hurt back. Right? So we're going to throw those quills right back if we do. Some of us are going to withdraw because we don't enjoy conflict. But then there are others who thrive off conflict for whatever reason. And so they're the ones who are going to probably throw the barbs back or they're going to try to stay in their own ground if they get hurt. Many folks, though, are going to withdraw. And they're going to be like, look, if this is how people are going to be at work, at home, in my family, in the church, if that's how it's going to be, I'm going to give up on all of it so that I don't get hurt again, and I'm going to withdraw and stay to myself. So the question then comes up, isn't a relationship with God enough? If I just chose, if I just got hurt, and I chose to do things alone, isn't it enough for me to have a relationship with God and God only? All right, no, you have to have more. What else? Is there anybody else have another thought? Is it okay just to have a relationship with God and Him only? Right, okay, so it is more enjoyable to be with fellow believers. And That's the key reason I'm here. There you go, and we're glad for that. That's right. Anybody else have a thought? 
Ah, so see, that's true. So if you withdraw, you can't love others, which means now, based on what we read, we're out of line of what Scripture has to say. Do you really need a relationship with other people? Where do we get that basis from that we need a relationship with other people? And where in Scripture? How far back? How far back? Adam and Eve. Let's go all the way back to Genesis, right? The foundation of what was laid. And if we look at that foundation in Genesis 1 and 2, you know, sometimes people say, I don't need anybody else. All I need is Jesus. I, I don't need other people. I just need Jesus. Well, that's not how God designed us. God designed us from the beginning. If you look all the way back at Genesis 1, he designed us to be relational. He designed us to have a relationship. He desired to have a relationship with Adam and Eve. And so as we look back at Genesis 1, let's just kind of, if you want to turn your scripture there uh, in Genesis 1, um, let's just take a look at a few things here in Genesis 1, and let's see what scripture has to say about having a relationship. So if you look at the creation story, there's a phrase that keeps occurring over and over. So in Genesis 1, I'm going to start in verse 3 and just read through several verses. I'll call out as I kind of skip around. So I'm going to start in verse 3, Genesis 1, 3. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was what? Good. All right. And God separated the light from darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. I'm going to skip down to verse 6. God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. And let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters. And there were under the expanse from the waters, and there were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening, and there was morning in the second day. Verse number 9. God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear. So it was, and God called the dry land earth, and the waters were gathered together. He called the seas, and God saw that it was good. There you go. Verse 11, God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants, yielding seed, fruit trees, bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on earth. And it was so, and the earth brought forth vegetation, plants, yielding seed, according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which their seed each according to its own kind. And God saw that it was? Good. There you go. And there was evening and there was morning in the third day. Verse 14. God said, let there be lights in the expanse of heavens to separate the day from the night. And let there be signs uh, for the seasons and for days and for years. And let, there, uh, let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heaven to give light to the earth, to rule over the day, to rule over the night, to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was? There you go. And there was evening and there was morning and now we're at the fourth day. God said, let the waters uh, swarm with uh, swarms of living creatures. Let the birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with it, uh, with the waters swarm. And according to kinds and every winged bird according to its kind and God saw that it was right so you get the sense through the seven days of creation God saw that it was good right <clears throat> then we enter in down at ver uh, chapter 2 where Adam and Eve begin to take the, take the picture here so starting in verse 4 of chapter 2 there are, there are the generations of heaven and earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. When no bush of the field was yet in the land and no plant in the field had yet sprung up for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust, the ground, and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant 
to the sight of good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The river flowed out of Eden to the water of the garden. There it divided and became four rivers. And the first of the river was Fishon. It was the one that had flowed around the whole land of Havalah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Uh, Bedlam, Onyx Stone was there. The name of the second river is Gion. Um, and it's the one that flowed from the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris. And it flows east of Assyria. And the fourth is the river Euphrates. Then, verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded him, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat it, you shall surely die. Verse 18, Then the Lord God said, It is not. What? Oh, right there. We have read a chapter and a half where God has said it is good numerous times. We get to the point where Adam has been created. Adam has been given charge of the garden. Adam is now in the garden. And we now have in verse 18 that the Lord God said it is not good. What is not good in verse 18? Right. It is not good that the man should be alone. It's kind of a radical change when you look at this passage in Genesis where everything that God created was good and then there's a declaration in here that says not good. But he quantifies it. He's not saying his creation is not good. But he realizes the need and we say that like God finally dawned on him, but we know that's not the case. God knew from the beginning. But God knows that it's not good for man to be alone. Transfer all of that even up to today's time. It's not good for us to be alone. So why is, question 11... Why is it so bad to be in isolation? So we looked at those questions. Question 11. Why is it so bad to be in isolation? Yeah, absolutely. Difficulty in getting out. Folks can't get out and then they can't do the things they do, which could compound on how they feel. They feel like they need to have the fellowship okay. with other people. That so there is a desire for them then to have fellowship and be around others? Yes, because I talk to all my clients. All day? Okay. That's good. Anybody else? So a coal all by itself, eventually, yeah. very quickly, actually, yeah. because there's nothing to pull from. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how many of you, and, I, and I'll say this uh, to the other question I've got that goes with this, why not distance rather than being hurt? Well, it's clear. God told us already in Genesis 2 there that it's not good to be alone. So distancing is not going to help yourself um, because you still need to have other people, fellow believers in our case, to be with. Um, and one of the reasons is, is, is this reason right here. Being in meaningful relationships is life-giving. So one of the reasons that it's important that isolation is so bad is because you can't develop meaningful relationships. And to be in meaningful relationships is actually 
life giving. There have been two studies, don't know if you've heard of them or not, there have been two studies. One of these research studies is called the Alameda County Study. Don't know how many people have heard of that, but here's what happened with that. Um, a Harvard scientist came in and tracked the lives of over 7,000 people over a period of nine years. Researchers found that the most isolated people were three times more likely to die than those with strong relational connections. The people who had bad health habits, such as smoking, eating poorly, uh, obesity, alcohol use, but they had strong social ties, lived significantly longer than people who had great health habits, but were isolated. Now, what that tells me is you better eat Twinkies with friends than broccoli alone, <laughs> is probably what that tells me. But being with people encourages one another. Building relationships is an encouragement. Being in a meaningful relationship is an encouragement. If you're doing it the right way, I would agree with that. Another study, the second one comes from the American Medical <laughs> Association. There were almost 300 volunteers that were infected with a virus that produces the common cold. It was not COVID. This was before that time yet. But these 276 people were infected with a virus that produces the common cold. The study found with these folks that those that had strong emotional connections fought off that infection four times better than those who were completely isolated. The people who were less susceptible to the colds and had less effect of the virus did better and produced significantly less mucus even uh, than those who were isolated. What does that mean? Unfriendly people are more snottier than others. I don't know, so you could, you could say that. But no, when you think about it, having a meaningful relationship is scriptural. Being alone is not God's design for us. Running away, sticking your head in the sand, pretending nothing is, nothing is going to bother you if you just isolate and go to yourself is not part of God's plan. God desires a relationship with us, and he desires that we have a relationship with other brothers and sisters in Christ. So let's go to 1 John 4. We've looked at some verses already. Let's see what that has to say as we take a look at some of these. So the question that I've got from here is, how are loving God and loving others related? What is that relationship between loving God and and loving others. Well, let's look at verse 7 of chapter 4. Verse 7 says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. That phrase, anyone who loves is born of God, emphasizes a relationship that God has for those of us who have accepted him as Lord and Savior. Only those who have experienced a new birth are able to have that love as it describes those born of God, those who accepted Christ, those who have been born of God. Now, what does that mean when I say born of God? What does that mean when Scripture says born of God? Salvation, right? So we have a physical birth. And what is our problem as humans when we are born physically? What are we born with? Sin, sin right? We don't just acquire sin after one year, two year, five years of age. We are born, and I don't know if you've thought about it this way, we are already born headed on a path to hell. The minute we're conceived, the minute we come out of that womb, we are born on a path to hell. We don't just jump onto that track. We don't just move over to that track. We're born that way. 
because we're born with sin. But the minute we realize what Christ has done for us, and the minute we realize that we have been forgiven because Christ shed his innocent blood on the cross, and we've accepted that, and we've repented from our sins, and we've turned our life around, we've been born of God. That's the salvation piece. And because we've been born of God, that means we now know God. First John, or not First John, but John chapter 1 uh, in verse, uh, verses 12 and 13, it says this. It says, but all to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were what? Born. Not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You know, being born of God and accepting him as our Lord and Savior, there's nothing we can do when we're born that would allow us to go to heaven by heritage, by birthright, by act of human will, by our own planning and our own work, none of that. We have to recognize who God is, and we have to recognize what his son has done for us so that in learning the sinful creature that we are and in learning what Christ has done for us, we ask the forgiveness of our sins, and in that, we are now born of God. Love for fellow Christians provides proof of spiritual birth and a relationship with God. So how are loving God and loving others related? When you show love for your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, it shows or provides proof of that spiritual birth and of a relationship with God. Having hatred or animosity towards your fellow brothers and sisters certainly does not do that. So let's jump to verse 8 for a second. Verse 8. And in verse 8, there's a statement that basically says, God is love. Are there other statements it up. Are there other statements in the Bible that say God is? Are there other statements in the Bible that say God is? And what does it say after that? God is a consuming fire. Okay, a consuming fire. God is what? Not mocked. Not mocked. Okay. God is merciful. merciful, okay. God is long-suffering. Long -suffering. Based on what we've talked about tonight, I've got, and over the past couple of weeks, I've got three that I want to share with you. The first one comes from John 4.24, and it says, God is spirit, right? God is spirit. So John 4.24 says this, God is spirit, and those who worship him must, not could, not halfway want to, but must worship him in spirit and truth. So God is spirit. The next one that I have is God is light. God is light. It comes from 1 John that we studied many weeks ago, uh, chapter 1 and verse 5. It says just simply that. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Then the third one, as my friend Gary here so greatly described, is that God is also a consuming fire. Now, the passage I'm reading to you is from Hebrews 12, 29, that says, For our God is 
a consuming fire. But that comes from several other passages as well. It comes from Exodus 24, 17, and it comes from Deuteronomy 4, 24. Now, if you remember your Old Testament, I'm not going to quiz you on it because there's a lot between Exodus and where we are in 1 John. But if you remember back in Exodus, between chapters 18 and chapters 24, the Israelites are at a very key location. Does anybody remember what that location would be? Mount Sinai, right? Okay. And what is the significance of Mount Sinai? Okay, so Moses is on the top of the mountain, and what is Moses doing at the top of the mountain? Getting the Ten Commandments, right? And so while Moses is up getting those Ten Commandments, what is the nation of Israel doing? Yeah, going down the tubes, they're, they're making a calf. They talk to Moses' brother Aaron. They bring Aaron all this gold. This is my favorite passage in all of uh, Exodus where Moses comes down because God's like, look, you've got to go down there because you're people, right? So your people are just really messed up, and they're really not adhering to the principles that I'm trying to lay out for you here. So Moses goes down. He sees all this hubbub going on. He looks over at Aaron and is like, what's going on? What is this golden calf? And Aaron responds, what? <laughs> yeah. Moses, I don't know how it happened. I just put all this gold in the fire and I'll pop this golden calf in the perfect form and shake. I don't know how. No, no. But God, at that point, Moses got angry and what happened? Broke, through, broke the tablets through them at that point. And so then Moses had to do what? Go back up the mountain and get another set of the Ten Commandments on tablets. We talk about our God be a consuming fire, but we talk about God being love. So let me ask this question. Can God be love, but yet can God be a consuming fire? What, how, how? How can you love somebody but yet consume them for what they've done? Well, the scripture that says, wouldn't any father, uh, a father does not show love to his kids, it's not discipline. Okay. So, in that case, yeah. So, God, is God going to discipline? Which could be the consuming fire piece of that? He's just, right? So because God is love, he shows his justice in a, in we may not consider a loving way, but to him it's a loving way. Um, and so it's justice on us that's served with love. Yep, I would say that. Um, a, uh, I, I look at several commentaries. In, in order to be a great theologian, you must use, you must use your full name or at least two initials like R.C. Spruill. A.W. Tozer, right, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Well, this is John R.W. Stott, right? And so he's got a commentary, which I look at uh, for just some things. And he's got a quote in here that says, He who is love is light and fire as well. Far from condoning sin, his love, God's love, has found a way to expose it because God is light and to consume it because he is fire without destroying the sinner, but rather saving him. <clears throat> when you think about that, God's love toward us is shown in his son, Jesus Christ. And when we accept him, it's no longer a consuming fire that ends our life. It's now a consuming fire that shows discipline and guidance for how we should live. Now, if we choose not to follow what Christ has told us, then we're headed down a path that is truly consuming fire that becomes an eternal fire uh, of hell. Many scriptures, and we read it today in, in verse 10. So somebody go to and share with me, or we have a couple of you. If you look at verse 10, somebody look at 1 John chapter 4, 10. And read to me what your version of Scripture says. 1 John 4.10 In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son 
to be the propitiation for our sin. Okay, so we have that God sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. Does somebody else have another version that says something different than propitiation? This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sin. Okay, as a sacrifice to take away our sin. So we have propitiation. We have as a sacrifice. Does anybody else have anything different? I've only run across the two. And in fact, one of them says an atoning sacrifice. When you look at NIV, NIV actually says it's an atoning sacrifice. But the question I have when we talk about these translations and we look at that, when your translation says propitiation, that is a really big churchy word. And you're going to look at that in Scripture and you're going to be like, what in the world? I've got to pull out the dictionary or I've got to Google it or I've got to do something Propitiation, that is a really, really big word. Well, what in the world does propitiation mean? Propitiation is really translated from the Greek word helosmos, which means appeasement or satisfaction. So when you look at that word propitiation, you can take that word and use, in other words, appeasement or was satisfied and when we look at that passage in 1 John 10 we can see instead of using that tone it was a propitiation it was a satisfaction of it was an appeasement meaning it was clear, cleared the way for us to have a full and right relationship with God there's several versions of that word though one of them is the verb, and if you look at the verb, the verb that I have listed there is halaskamai, and that is to make satisfaction for. When we look at that particular verb, to make satisfaction for, one of the examples where it's used in that context um, is found in Hebrews 2.17. Hebrews 2.17 says, Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. Now, what is that he, being Christ, had to be made like his brothers? What does that mean right there, his brothers? Mankind, right? So, therefore, Christ had to be made like mankind in every respect, so that he, Christ, might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make, there's that big word, propitiation, to make satisfaction and not our satisfaction but God's satisfaction for the sins of the people that's the verb you have another word that also goes with that which is and that should be an L not an I so I apologize hilasterion and what that is it's basically the sacrifice of atonement that is required to satisfy God's wrath you see this term used in the Old Testament. This is the term that is used when we talk about the Day of Atonement that the Israelites had to do once a year. It also is mentioned in Romans, if you look at Romans 3.25, within that same context, whom God put forward as a propitiation as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over the former sins. If you think back to Old Testament and you think back to the Israelites who wandered in the wilderness and they had to set up a tent, they had to travel with the tent as they wandered in the wilderness and inside that tent was placed what what was in the tent the ark of the covenant right and so in the tent the ark of the covenant who's the only person that could go back with the ark of the covenant the high priest, the high priest right so now the high priest is back there he goes behind the veil right so if you look in the temple you've got 
the outside of the temple, which is where the majority of the people went. You had the inside of the temple, and then inside the temple you had another veil, which is behind that veil, which is where the Ark of the Covenant was, which is the only person who go back there was the high priest. Now, what did they put on the high priest to see to make sure he was still alive? A rope and a what? And a bell or some sort to make sure he was still moving. And if they heard him move, you'd drag him out by the rope because you could not go back to where that Ark of the Covenant was. It was protected. God was very specific in this declaration of the Ark of the Covenant. And I'm just going to read to you some of this. Uh, it comes from Exodus 25, verses 10 through 22. You can go back and look at it later. But it says this. They shall construct an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, two and a half cubits wide, one and a half cubits high. You shall overlay it with pure gold inside and out. You shall overlay it, and you shall make gold molding around it, and you will cast four gold rings for it and fasten them on its four feet. And two rings shall be on one side of it, and two rings shall be on the other side of it. You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put on uh, the... Let's see. Sorry. You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark and carry the ark with them. So were they allowed to touch the ark? Nope, not at all. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be removed from it. You shall put into the ark the testimony which I shall give you. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits long, one and a half cubits wide. You shall make two cherubim of gold. You will make them of hammered work at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherubim at one end, one cherubim at the other. You shall make the cherubim of one piece with the mercy seat at its two ends. The cherubim shall have their wings spread upward, covering the mercy seat with their wings facing one another. The faces of the cherubim are to be turned toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat at the top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony which I will give you. There I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak to you about all that I will give you in commandment for the sons of Israel. The mercy seat was the lid of the ark, the cover of the ark. And you've heard people talk about Shekinah glory, right? So it was situated between the Shekinah glory cloud above the ark and the tablets inside the ark. The priests took blood and from the sacrifices that were made as a part of the Day of Atonement and they sprinkled that blood on the mercy seat. It was at that place where the atonement for sin occurred. When we talk about that, that's a vision of the Old Testament and what the Israelites had to go through in order to be forgiven of their sins. It was an annual element that they had to go through to be forgiven of their sins. If that were enough to satisfy, they wouldn't have to do it annually. You ever think about that? Christ completed the work, and when he died on the cross for our sins, because his blood was perfect, that finished it. You know, the title of this portion of Scripture that we're reading in 1 John that I've given it is God demonstrates his love. There's no greater love than what Christ has done for us by the shedding of his perfect blood. What the Israelites had to go through in the Old Testament was ritual. What the Israelites had to do in the Old Testament was an annual ritual for the atoning of their sins. But that blood was not perfect. The only blood that was perfect was Christ's blood that was shed on the Christ cross for us. Because Christ's blood was pure. When Christ came to earth, he came as a man, but he did not come as a sinful man. 
The folks in John's time still struggled in understanding that Christ came as a man. John is laying out for them in this book of 1 John the importance of Christ's coming. John has laid out for them Christ came as the ultimate atoning sacrifice for your sins. It is not any longer a ritual that is to be completed over and over and over. It's done and finished. So why was, the next question, propitiation necessary? One word. Why was the atoning sacrifice of Christ necessary for us? Because of what? Three letters. Sin. Yep. That's why. The atoning sacrifice of Christ was necessary because of sin. God's wrath is satisfied by the punishment of Christ on the cross. John 3, 14 through 18 says this, And Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Ultimate sacrifice. Verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. What does that statement mean? Whoever does not believe is condemned already. How are they condemned already? Because they were born into sin. Correct. They were born condemned. And if you choose never to trust Christ, you are condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. He did not accept the atoning sacrifice of Christ and what Christ has done for us. Isaiah talks about it as well. If you look back at Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53, verses 5 through 10 say, But he, Christ, was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, because we're born with that sin nature. And the Lord has laid on him, Christ, the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away and as for his generation who considered that he was cut out of the land of the living stricken for the transgressions of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. And although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. And the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Spoken well before Christ became the ultimate sacrifice. But Isaiah, prophesying to the people of Israel, letting them know what was coming. The Messiah is coming. And here's what the Messiah is going to do. It's going to be the ultimate sacrifice for us. If you look in uh, Romans 5.8... It says, but God showed his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If you look at Ephesians 1, 7, in him, 
We have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespass according to the riches of his grace. John made very plain in his writings from verse 10 of chapter 4. In this is love that we, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice, the one whose blood would more than satisfy what God needed for us to have a right relationship with him. My question for those here, those online, have you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you accepted him as the one who was the atoning sacrifice for your sins? Do you realize that if you do not accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are already condemned and already on a path to hell? I would challenge you that if you have not accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, let today be the day. Let tonight be the night. Look at your life and look at the relationship that's there. As we've talked about, God is very relational. He desires a relationship with us. My question is, do you have a relationship with him? Let's pray together. Father, tonight we've looked for many weeks on love. Multiple examples and multiple ways that we could look at this, but tonight is the ultimate example of how you have demonstrated your love for us. Lord, you've demonstrated your love for us by the sending of your perfect Son, Jesus Christ. Father, because he was sinless, his blood was perfect to atone for the sins of the world. Lord, I'm thankful that Christ died on the cross for my sins. For Lord, I am a sinner. But Father, I'm a sinner who is forgiven because I've asked you to come and live in my heart. I've asked you to forgive me of my sins. And Father, I pray that you would be able to keep me on the right path and not be distracted by the temptations of this world. But Father, stay focused on the foundation of your word. Father, I thank you that you showed so much love for us. And now, Father, I pray for those that have never thought about the love of God, that this would be the time that they would do so. Father, I pray for those that are here, if they would like to talk about that. Myself, Pastor Chuck, are available to do so. Online, they're welcome to call the church office. We'd be glad to talk to them and share the good news of the gospel with them as well. Share what it means to have a Savior who loves you so much that he shed his innocent blood so we could be forgiven. We ask these things in your holy and precious name. Amen. All right, we'll give that a minute.